If you've thought about traveling, living in a foreign country, how to be an expat, how to navigate and get around, how to make friends, and how to live your best life, this is your episode. Welcome to Jill Collins Connections. Today, I interview Liana Neal, who's a dear friend of mine that I met while living in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Today, she lives in London with her husband and her two daughters. We talk about living in a foreign country, all the ins and outs, what it's like to live there, learning the language, navigating the stores and the shopping and making friends. And we get back into our own personal stories about all the experiences we had. And I think this one is really personal for me. So if you've thought about traveling, living in a foreign country, check it out. What is unique about expats? How rich and beautiful it is to be an expat? It's a lot to be unique as an expat because it's a very small percentage in the world. <laughs> it's like a one percentage of the people that get to live this life. What expatriate means, except for the fact that they look at you like, oh no, sorry, <laughs> they kick you out of your country. <laughs> expatriate means basically that a multinational, a company, or the diplomats, an organization, take you away from your country and put you in another country. This comes with a lot of amazing benefits in terms of financial, and they take care of you, and you can save a lot of money, and most of the things in this other country are paid. Yeah, that's the real expat. It's not a person that chooses by their own to go somewhere else because that you did it your own is the person that is being taken away from and put it somewhere else. Being alone is a very powerful tool. And if you use that well, it helps you to go to places that you cannot go if you are surrounded by people. You need quiet, you need silence inside. We are totally social animals. We need to be in packs, in groups. But if your focus is 100% of being inside, you need to learn how to get out of that to get into yourself, to listen to your thoughts, to get into your own energy, to get into your own space and ideas and beyond. But you need to balance it with, now it's come the key word, with the right people. I want to welcome everyone once again to Jill Collins Connections. We are here with, I'm telling you, the most dynamic woman I think I've ever met in my life. She is a dear friend of mine that I've known for many years. Liana Neal is the quintessential connector. She, we are aligned so well because we both have the same purpose, the same passion to, to connect others and to connect people to things and to resources and experiences. We met first, we first met, gosh, years ago while she was living in Buenos Aires and I'm still part-time here in Buenos Aires, but she was living here with her husband and her two beautiful daughters and we connected at one of her events, actually. She's a founder of Expat Life, which is an expat group for um, people just coming into a new place, a new community, particularly in this situation in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So she created this community for newbies and for people who are living here that were foreigners. And so she's a way shower. She's a guide. She's this person who you want to plug into when you first get to a new city because she'll show you the way. She will get you hooked up to all the things that are relevant to your life and what you need and what you're looking for and seeking. So you, whenever you have Leah and Neil in a city that you're living in, you'll never be, <laughs> you will never be friendless. I can promise you that. She's also the founder and general manager of Club Porteño Provoca. I love the way it's spelled P-R-O-V-A-Q-A. -A. It's so cool. <laughs> and this is where she connects people around the world. She's an expert at creating, organizing, and hosting unique events and experiences in South America and Europe. And now I'm hearing around the world. So there's some new things coming up we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I, as I said, I think she's just the quintessential connector, a master at building communities. I'm really in awe of her ability uh, to of bringing people together. She just, I love how she includes everyone she meets and she's up to just so many amazing things in this world and she's taking it on by storm. So I think you definitely need to follow this interview today and follow Liana. We're going to talk about, you can get her on Instagram and I'll post the links below in the description, but I want to welcome you, my friend. Thank you so much <laughs> for being here. You are amazing. And you're living in no. London now. You've been there for a couple of years, I think, right? Yes. Now almost three years. Yeah. Officially four in a way, but let's say three, 
thinking about yeah. the whole crazy pandemic and all that. But yes, my Julie, I'm super happy to be here. I don't know what to say after this amazing introduction. Likewise, as well, as you say, we connect so well. We are hunger for the world, uh, for people, for connections, full of energy and wanted to live life to the full. And I think that's what we hear totally. Mm. Mm. You should yeah. get most of, I think you're, where your happy moments are is when you see someone experiencing something that you showed them or you brought to them. It's one of your happy Absolutely. Absolutely. So basically it's like when we met so long ago, are we talking probably 13 years ago? What more? I don't know. It was probably at least eight, maybe more, but something in there. Yeah, because I've been here 13 years. So it could have been, yeah, maybe almost 13. And uh, but it's hard to remember the exact moment. I just remember so many different events that you've had and experiences in your home, your beautiful home here in Buenos Aires that you had in the suburbs and having we, it was called it's called the cake house which is so sweet yes. I love it and, and it was, you, it know, was like always, you got invited to the cake house that was really fun and and so we did that did you, did you remember why I called the cake house no why'd you call it the cake house because the moment I walk into that house I felt that it should be the house that should have the smell of somebody being cooking cooking or what is the name bakery Baking, at the yeah. kitchen Oh. Yes, those houses that is, it needs to have the smell of, of a cake all the time. So it, it, that's why it became the cake house. It's really that reason. And, t- and I tell you who helped me to pick up that name, Danny. Danny, Danny Booney. Or yeah. Danny, yes. Oh, not surprising. <laughs> not surprising. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah it's, we've so, had good times there. And then I remember polo, you always would arrange amazing polo final at the polo yeah. finals. We have these superior experiences where you'd have private spaces in VIP areas and you just always make everyone feel welcome. And, oh, and, and thank you. You we're so great at, at just anyone who was new, we'd send them your way and you just, they immediately were plugged into anything from schools for kids and parents who were going, had kids going to school. And you just have this knack for just, just making people feel at home. And then another thing I love about you is your intense drive. And I think that's something I didn't know about you in the beginning. We were probably more party friends. Like we'd always get together and it was champagne and and cocktails and social situations. But I had a really great opportunity, I guess going back a bit is I remember when after my husband, my late husband, when he died almost seven years ago now, you were, I got here like within two weeks after he died and at my door inside the lobby, I had flowers and no one sends flowers here. They'll bring flowers, but no one actually has flowers delivered. And they came from you and your husband, Piers and your family. And I just thought that was so touching. I know we all get a lot of flowers when someone passes, but for some reason that really touched me because it was just, no one thinks to do that. And it was just really special. So I want to thank you for that. And you've helped me on my journey going through grief and helping me stay busy and to find things to do and to really reinvent myself and find a new life. And you were one of the catalysts that helped me get there. And my friends, this is a country and my friends and my community here is really what helped me heal. And you're an integral part of that. And my deal is, I think we all through this amount of years been through a lot, as we know, and that particular time for you, I remember we just went out, I don't know how many months before your husband passed away. And oh, that's right. I know. You remember, it was a crazy night. Was it the night. limo night? Was that the limo or... night with the girls? Oh my gosh, that's right. We need to not. What happens in that in that limo? The party, whatever limo van needs to stay. In that party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Oh, and the Charlie's Angels, we were remember because we the driver Charlie's was Charlie. Angels because the driver was Charlie. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> it was amazing. But that night, you told me something super special. That you know when people is watching you and you don't know and you're not aware, you just do things because that's your way. And then you told me these words exactly in tequila, the nightclub. Nightclub. <laughs> you can probably uh, post a few photos just for fun in this interview, like little flashes. We'll have the guys add some for fun. Anyway, go I ahead. love it. I love it. And, and, and it was just that they, they were, I know you were telling me these words with. You mean, you, mean, you mean every single word of that. And it was that, that I was a little bit of your inspiration and of en- a ball of energy and all these beautiful things that you say about me that is just, this is what I always say that I have two superpowers, family and friends. 
<laughs> it's one of those things. And that also impacts on me. Like the flowers for you, they were so special and you don't forget about them for the reason, your own reason. That night for me was also like, oh, wow, this woman, the way that she sees me is very special. And I think that was the super connection that we, we started having, uh, not just as a party uh, peers, but as, a, as persons, as humans that deep connection that you need to have with someone. And we have so many beautiful insiders of talks and talks. One oh of the God. times that I, also, I love is when we went to, to, to Jose Ignacio. In, in, I was going to say Punta Leste was one I was about to mention. You read my mind. And that was amazing for your followers. Uh, basically, we went to, we were by ourselves. We all, it's very healthy to be by yourself many times. And, and we decided to spend a couple of nights uh, having dinner and chatting and super relaxing in, a, in the most crazy town at this season. It was in the middle of summer when everybody goes a bit crazy there. Gorgeous town. But we were just eating, talking, reflecting, and it was super special. That was another time that we definitely completely bombed. Bon definitely yeah. and i think too also yeah that was the, there were so many good times and as i stopped drinking three and a half almost four years ago and I, here's something i found and we talked about this when we were in cartagena i was there for five weeks last august or july and august and you joined me for the weekend which is where you're from colombia and yeah. i remember telling you how when i stopped drinking i was concerned that i would lose my friends and Here's what I, the insight and the, and the profound thing that happened is that the friends that left were fine, but then there were those that stayed like you and others that our relationship actually grew and it was so much more enhanced. It was like so much deeper and so much more like there was just so much more we could talk about. And you and I had the most amazing conversations in Cartagena last year that I got to know you in a whole new way. I didn't even realize about you, things about you, just how spiritual you are and how much you're into meditation and really being in touch with your higher self. And we talked about Mind Valley and we were going through a lot of different things. And I just, I, I went, oh my gosh, this is a Leon I never knew. And I wonder how many people like that, that have depth that I probably couldn't connect with while I was drinking because it was more about the, oh, let's have fun, let's drink, let's just have a good time and keep it light that I wasn't capable at those in those moments to really tap in and get any deeper with it, with many people. And part of that might've been my grieving process too, but I'm grateful for that, those, that trip, that weekend that you were there. And, and I, yeah, and, yeah, tell me more. No, that's a huge subject, the, the drinking. I'm guilty of it <laughs> until now, but it's, it's hundred percent because no, alcohol definitely is a distraction. Alcohol definitely, people use it to, 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 to open up in situations where they are uncomfortable and it's a distractor. It's a, if you enjoy a glass of wine, I love wine and I enjoy the glass of wine I, and I know about wine and et cetera, that's part of it. But just for the sake of drinking, lose perspective and et cetera, and not necessarily always when you go out, you have to have a drink. Yes, I remember when you told me I'm not drinking. Obviously, the first thing you do is until when? Yeah. <laughs> you don't you don't Because we definitely, we had that one covered. I was an expert, a true professional. And uh, yeah, so that was a big part of my life then. That, that yes, and, and then suddenly for real, and I tell you the strong example of that. And the, the strong example is, yes, I will have a drink with you. I will have the, 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 the glass of wine, but yeah. it will be just that because I need to keep into our level. Mm -hmm. To be able to have a proper, good conversation. Yes. And I admire that from you because, it, and the fact that, that you were scared about losing friends, it, it happens. And of course, it makes sense that this type of thing, it's sad, but happens. Because normally the drinkers, you find your peers of the ones that you yeah. identify yourself with. And, and normally is when somebody says to me, I'm, I don't drink. Initially, I tell you before you, I used to go, ooh. Yeah. Oh, me too. Me too. It's, oh, let's not invite them because they're, they're not fun. Let's not invite them. You find the people that you know are going to keep up with you. And believe me, I was usually the ringleader. I'm always the one going, hey, anybody want to open another bottle? Let's just have one more. Come on, let's all. It was more because I related that to pleasure, to excitement, to fun. And it's like, you don't want it to end. And so, yeah. And today, I, I mean, I have alcohol. I had a party the other night, as we talked about earlier for my uh, good friend. And I'm out all the time with people who drink. It it just became part of my identity that I'm a non-drinker. And so when I decided that, 
in the beginning, it was a little hard at first because everybody kept saying, when are you going to drink again? And when I'm wondering, like, when will that be? It was a struggle. The minute I decided as an identity, I said, I'm a non-drinker. It was like, I don't eat red peppers. I don't like red peppers. If I see a red pepper, am I going to eat it? I'm not even tempted by a red pepper because I don't like them. I don't want them. I know what they do to my body, my stomach. And I'm like, I'm eating a red. And so for me, alcohol, it's, I've got a whole bar. I have enough liquor in my house right now that I could have open a bar. No joke. Yeah. And, but it's, I see it every day. It's like another fixture. It's like a vase on a table. It's alcohol, whatever. It doesn't phase me. Now I know not, I'm not going to discredit addiction as it's had that way, because I know I have many family members, close friends, people who struggle with it and um, who are in recovery and they need meetings and they need that connection. And I am all for that. I'm merely speaking my experience and that for me, that change in identity of how I saw myself was the trick for me. And there really hasn't been a day, even in my lowest moments, which there have been many lately, is mm-hmm. that I don't think if I just drank again, it'd be everything be okay. It's just, it doesn't even cross my mind because it's just one is the you one know, you know, know I've not. done and I'm proud of, and I've got a track record. It's the one thing I can say, gosh, I've got three and a half years. I know the date. It's a really good, it's a really good date mm-hmm. too, because it's a good one. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to blow it. It's nine nineteen nineteen. I'm like, who gets wow. a better sobriety date than that? I'm like, that's an easy one to remember. It's a good date. I don't want to mess it up. And then two, it's just, it's, I just haven't found a reason that it's worth doing. And, but I don't, I I love being around people who want to have drinks, who want to socialize, who want to party. People drink a lot around me. And I just, it's just, I'm the lemonade girl. They have great lemonade here in Buenos Aires, by the way, the lemonade with the mint and the ginger and the, oh, they're delicious with the ginger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love Mm -hmm. that. So I'm the lemonade girl now, but I think I drank enough for three lifetimes in the days. And you know what? I'm also (laughs) grateful for those times because I'm telling you, I don't write off as much as I watch videos and look back on things we've done, I'm like, oh my God. But I'm also like, that was so hilarious. And how much fun did we have? And so I am so grateful for those moments too. And yes. just fun. We had so dang much fun back then. And then now how much fun we had in Cartagena and we went out to dinner and you introduced me to, what was the name of that place we went to? Oh uh, my God. Oh my God. Uh, I shouldn't say it, but yeah, he, that was a- Juan del Mar. Juan del Mar. Juan del Mar. Yeah. Juan del Mar is a great restaurant in the old town in Cartagena. And we went there. I went back even after you left. We went there, I think twice. And the owner is great. Even danced, when you were dancing there, I think it was salsa. <laughs> you were so bad. <laughs> that was okay. That might've been one moment in my life in, in recent memory that I was thinking, God, I wish I did have a drink right now because <laughs> like I go to the bathroom and she's sitting there and she's talking, there's this guy on the dance floor who's dancing salsa by himself. Where he grabs this like older woman, which is so cute. It's so adorable. And she's, you should dance with him. He's looking at you. And I'm like, I'm not going to dance with this guy. And so then I go to the bathroom and what does this girl do? Oh yeah. You got to love your friends. She's over there and she already worked it all out. And so the minute I get back to the table, the guy's standing there and he's asking me to dance. And I'm like, and she's go. So I did. Oh, and, I, yes. and it was fun. It was really fun. And you did it amazingly well. Yes. She's in Cartagena that is on the coast of Colombia where everybody dances, doesn't matter what. Of course, Jilly it was to great. Dance. And so I love that you push me. I love my friends who push me out of my comfort zone. And that is because I am usually my secret weapon. If you ever see me and you know me personally, or you, when you ever see me somewhere, and if I'm videotaping something, it means I'm uncomfortable and I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that shit. So like when everyone's dancing, the line dancing, or they're doing something silly, I'm like, oh, I'll videotape you. Yes. Oh, I'll be. Yeah, that's, it. That's, it. that's my way of not having to participate, but being engaged in something. So yeah, that, but I love the friends that will force me to do things that ultimately. We did a lot. We did a lot of that. In, oh you've my done God. That a lot. In, in, in Punta, let's see, that one night we were out and remember we got stuck in the rain. We went to that event up in, up on the not north of the Punta that place with it was like a carpet thing it was a red carpet thing and then nobody yeah and then we did that then we went over to i think we started at either we started la oasia we started la oasia and then we went to the other thing and then we went back to la oasia and that was about the time it started raining but i think no we went to la oasia after we went to that beach party the sunset thing what was that place what's the name of that place again do you know the one where we were dancing and everybody oh i love the place la chosa or something like that la Yeah. yeah That was so fun. And and yeah, so definitely got me out of my comfort zone there. Then we walked across the way to, a way, I mean, it was a good ways, in the mud with the rain coming down to to La Uesha. And yeah, we both, I have great pictures. It was a storm. storm. But but, 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 no, my my favorite one with you is when I took you to Cartagena 
to that beach where oh my God. Was... <laughs> that was getting me out of <laughs> That like, was Leona. Where are the fancy beaches? Can we like rent a chair where they'll bring us like food and drinks and like they'll set up our chair and they'll put the towel? And she's no. I'm like, they, they did, but very rustic. <laughs> it's very rustic. Yeah, it was very rustic. <laughs> I got with the fish, with the fish this big and the Coco Loco, yours without the alcohol. <laughs> oh my God, it was brilliant on those chairs that were sinking into the sun and oh god it was brilliant see you eating I said just eat with the hands it's okay it's good <laughs> like, okay Liana it was brilliant I love I, I don't mind like street food and all that I'm fine I'm not being like like a snob or anything but it was the thought of it and then getting there and the, they were white plastic sit up like chairs with a back there were no, no it was, it was, chairs it was just a, and, then, and then it's oh do you want a covered space we're like do you want like an umbrella I'm thinking oh no, we're okay. And then it's, oh yeah, we have the umbrella, but it's four sticks in the sand with a blue tarp, just with holes, just cut up. And it's like slanted. And we're sitting under that with a little wood table and these two little plastic. Uh, oh like, my God, you need to chairs. show these, those videos. I have to find a little picture. Well, we're definitely going to post follow-ups on this because it was, it was great. That was brilliant. That was too funny, but we did well. We spent two hours there and it was, those are the moments you see. Mm -hmm. exactly those are the moments if we just carry on the plane thing we would have a good time because we are made for good time but that's the memory that makes us now talk about it and love about it it's just it was just so so fantastic and, and then everybody coming up and wanting to touch us and can you massage do you want this do you want that and we're like no we're good and you're like yeah learning how to say no to people you need to say no don't smile though, because i i had it before when i yeah. was like oh thank you and then and I was telling you, you've got to almost, you've got to almost be mean. And I hate that because it's, you almost have to just like, it as if they're not there because the minute you smile and say, no, thank you. You make eye contact and they're thinking they got a chance and you're so sweet and I should be, but I, for some reason, I don't have that, that streak in me when this you happens. You are so good. Yeah. But I'm like this and I'm like, no, gracias. And I just keep walking <laughs> and it's, and she, Liana's probably going, oh, what a bitch. But I'm like, no, it's, if you go, oh no, gracias. Then they go, look, what about? And it's, and then you're like hooked into it and you have to explain why you don't need it. And that you, da, da, da. No, and it's a cow. It's a cow <laughs> because I, 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 was, I, I did it like days before and that didn't work. But yeah, I was super, super surprised. You were telling me, you teach me. I was looking at you. I'm like, wow, she really knows how to, mm, nice. Yeah. From, and from the, the and Midwest the, of Wisconsin, usually we're Midwest nice, but in that case, I'm usually not because I just, I figured it out. It can't be. But I tell you, back into that subject of being uncomfortable, being in places, I was super, super proud of you, of the fact that you choose to go to Colombia. And Colombia is my country. I love it. And it's the best and everybody needs to go. But it's a special. <laughs> you, you need to go. You, you need to know. And you didn't know a thing. And you walk out of the hotel and they already called you gringa without yeah. even opening your mouth. Do you remember? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you stay there for how long was that? Almost it was month? like five, uh, five weeks or so. Yeah. Five or six weeks. Yeah. Alone and, like and, and, yeah. And it was so cool because I had, I was in a beautiful penthouse and yeah. the exchange, no money. It was such a great deal. And, and the guy came here to my place and they used it in February for the same amount of time. But I think it's just exploring, being willing to take chances. It's doing things out of our comfort zones or where is where the magic is. It's when we stay in our comfort zone, life's okay, but it can be a little flat. It's that if, for me, I've been isolating a lot lately and it's, I know the remedy for that. It's being around people, finding a way to get around people, finding a way to serve, finding a way to give back, finding not just online, not just in places like clubhouse or on zoom or communities and chats it's actually i have learned this lately it's just jill what is missing for me and what's missing is that being physically around other people and we really got that i think a lot of us found that i, I was good the first couple of years with covid with the with the pandemic i got dressed every morning like this like i was going to work and i sat at my desk every day and i was doing stuff and i was busy in a new way, because I was creating communities for people yeah. in the platinum partners community that I'm in and other things. And we were creating zoom, we were doing zoom calls. We were setting or doing kind of like events that we would do, but doing them online. And it just gave me I purpose. Remember. But I think what happened, especially in the past year or two is that now I'm used to being alone more. And so it seems like it's more of a 
I don't know, struggle, but I've noticed when I go to events, I'll be honest, I have, and I never had this in my life, but I have social anxiety a little bit. Like I'm there and I'm like, oh, I got to get, I got to peel away. This is a lot. And when it's that awkwardness that I don't recall I had in the past. And I think a lot of people deal are dealing with that today. And we we're so we're able to get lost in our phones for hours, for days and time goes by. And all of a sudden we, for me, I beat myself up. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, I just spent four hours on my phone and I should have been doing something else. And now it's th- three o'clock in the afternoon and I haven't done without whatever I wanted to set out to do. So it's a it's almost a, it builds and it stacks. And it, and then this lack of self-esteem or lack of confidence and trust in myself to show up for me. I think what you said earlier is how I show up when no one's looking. Yeah, I have an appointment with you to have a call to, for us to interview today. But what did I do when there were no scheduled time, when there wasn't scheduled time after this or before this? It, did I do my meditation today when no one's looking? Did I do my affirmations? Did I pray? Did I go for a walk? Did I eat right? Am I drinking my water? all these kinds of things that if I don't do it, nobody's going to know who knows me Yourself. and my, and what I'm learning is when I'm not showing up for myself, I lose trust in myself and then I can't rely on myself. And so that's that lack that where the confidence starts to break down. And then it's that insecurity and the feeling like an imposter, all these different feelings and this negative downward spiral. And I'm just saying all of that to say that I think there are a lot of people out there today, like me that have been in that space. And they're just like, I don't know how to get out of that. And I want to ask you is how would you, how would you get, how do you deal with that? And you're always a somewhere and you're always hustling it. And that's why I admire you so much, because no matter what's going on, you are like, there's always a way there's always a way. Definitely, but never easy and takes a lot of being conscious of the amount of things that you just say, being alone is a very powerful tool. And if you use that, it helps you to, to go to places that you cannot go if you are surrounded by people. You need quiet, you need silence to get inside, yeah? But if your focus is 100% of being inside, we are totally social animals. And animals, animals, literally. And we need to be in packs, in groups. In So you need to learn how to get out of that, to get into yourself, to, to listen to your thoughts, to, to get into your own energy, to get into your own space and ideas and, and beyond. But you need to balance it with, now it's come the key word, with the right people. Yes. So when we are teenagers, it's all about acceptance. So we became somebody else because we need to be accepted by whatever is out there that is the new trend. Yeah. And unluckily, cools and anything to do with education, they don't teach you tools very young, actually from even when you are a kid, to deal with society, to understand that that your own thoughts and your own being and your own self, the way that you look when you look at, at the, the mirror, acceptance and loving yourself, that's not been teach anywhere. So you get super killed by society, more teenagers when they're changing, etc. But we carry on with that from young teenagers to young adults and beyond. And then we arrive into an age, say 30, 30 something, when we believe that we figure out this friend thing, but also in our case that we live outside of our countries as expats, we need to find people because these people is super necessary for survivor, to, to survive in a country that you don't know, that you don't speak the language, that you don't know how the, the whole thing goes. So you start, whoever is friendly with you, you go, oh, hello, how are you? Oh, yes, great. And you completely melt into that, whatever is going on and agreeing to things and et cetera. Okay, and that's totally normal and, and is, is a perfectly good way. And more if you are new into the whole expat experience. Now, years pass and if you're an expat and you carry on travel, you became more savvy of wherever you go, you have a little bit more conscious of, okay, this person will be my friend if I met this person in another circumstance in my own country and you have sometimes those answers where you go I don't think so but here it works and sometimes that friendships they last for the three years that you are in a country or four years the moment that you go it just vanishes alone because also no one person can feel everything you have friends that are good to listen other friends that are good for party other friends that are good for crying for love no one person know your partner know your mother know your father know your sister, brother, are, is one person that can fill up 
a fool someone. So with friends, even more. So when you try to make a friend, that person that is going to save you, that is the one that is going to listen to you, is the one that's going to entertain you, it's not going to happen. So then when you move a little bit more older in general, not just expats, but get older, and I'm 46 now, you're arriving to a place where it's honestly open your closet and look at the clothes. And this is terrible how it sounds, but it is. And then you start seeing a lot of things that are hanging there. Actually, sometimes sucking your energy because the moment that you open this closet full of, in this case, people, it's people that is sitting there that is not serving really a purpose. And then you start cleaning and, and, and say, okay, this is not really a friendship. Or this person really is always waiting for me to do something. It's not a reciprocal. And then at the end, you stay really with a group of people that, that you feel good with it. Mm. And in the same place, when you go out and you socialize and you meet new people that I adore to do that. Yeah, met new people. It's so interesting. Different brains, different thinking, different lives, different ages, etc. It, it fits me, you know, with knowledge. With, but it still doesn't mean I'm going to become friends with everybody that I met. Because yeah. I have yeah. very clear now what I want to surround me. So mm -hmm. you have a great time with people, you embrace everyone, but the moment that you go back into your house, into your quiet, into your silence, yeah, the person that resonates the most, I think is the person that I personally will, okay, that person might be the person that I would like to hang out more or get to know better or et cetera. And that happens with relationships in every single sense of the equation. That is more or less what I think uh, when you need to be alone and you have to be alone. Because that's the only way you find your voice. And, and your being side. alone. Yeah, and yeah. being alone, but not just in a, because I there's a difference between being alone and keeping yourself occupied, whether it be watching Netflix or playing a game on your phone or looking Absolutely. at social media, that's not being alone. You're talking no. about being alone where we're totally in silence, sitting with our thoughts, whether you're a meditator or not. It's that just being in a quiet, still place where there's no distraction, where you're just it's hard for to, in today's world to just completely sit alone. Totally. And Even, I, yeah. Alone or lonely? I think which is the right word there? Lonely or, or alone? Well, alone or? is like being alone. Lonely is like a feeling we have when we feel like we All right. are alone. So I think right. it's, yeah. So the world is alone. Yeah, when we're alone, when we're by ourselves. Alone is by ourselves. By ourselves. Yeah. Because you can do, you can put something. I did something, I think I told you this years ago, I've been married for 23 years. I have beautiful two daughters, but probably, I don't know, whatever, 17 years ago, I suddenly turn around to my husband, to Pierce, and I say, hmm, I don't know who I am if I am not the wife, the mother, the person that is from Colombia now living in Argentina, that runs this expat group. And I say, I don't remember the last time I danced in my underwear alone with loud music in my house because I used to do that a lot. Yeah, I, <laughs> I guess. Myself in the shadows of the walls of the reflection of the windows. And if it was a mirror, even better. So I used to do that a lot. And suddenly I was like, it's not there anymore. So yes, I was the, the, the vibrant, the life of the party, et cetera, et cetera. But it was all like, it's not a play because you are there for sure of uh, and the moment. But in my knee, I wasn't that fire person alone and it was because I never was alone because I was even with peers or with my girls or with so I decided to present I need a week and he goes do you want to go to an island <laughs> and I say no I'm not talking about that so I remember booking a hotel he booked me a hotel in Palermo uh -huh. oh my god you know which hotel ultra <laughs> Nick Douglas the owner of ultra it, it owns that place I've heard of that guy. Yeah, I remember I that. Went, yeah, yeah, I went there and I stayed there for a week. No one knew I was there. No one. Mm -hmm. Except for my husband and my daughters. No friends, nothing, because it wasn't about to go and go out alone by myself with other people and have fun. No, it was to see if I can feel and recover, to wake up at three in the morning that I'm not going to bother anyone because they're sleeping beside me because this, because that, and put loud music and just start just dancing and going nuts and then go to a restaurant and have a meal by myself 
with a book. These things that you always conscious think twice. Oh, how embarrassing to have a meal by myself. What people is going to think. Who cares if, if they think. So that was very super. I realized that. I thought, God, I need to be by myself in another circumstance that is not even my own. I couldn't do it in my house. You need to find some little outside. You need to be aware of your feelings mm. and not avoiding them. Distracting them is going out. Distracting them is drinking alcohol. Distracting them is always busy with the phone. All these things are distractions to avoid you. Then and why do you think you- we do that? Why do you think we avoid ourselves? that actual time. There are moments when I'm in that space myself. And I find that when I'm in that space, it's like even the moment of falling asleep with nothing on the TV or any music, wow. it's like that, oh, okay, now I got to see. And when, when you drink, going to bed I at think, night, it's I like think. you just fall asleep and pass out. You don't have that moment to sit there and wonder and think you just crash. And so like that now in the past few, few years, it's, oh, you fall asleep and you're very conscious. You're very alert, aware. And it's that what are we afraid of in those thoughts of what are we going to find out? Is that is what is that resistance? I have that resistance all the time. It's like meditate. Mm. I've tried accountability meditation. I went to Dr. Joe a year ago for a week. I'm like, okay, I'm going to like my inner like intervention myself. Like I will force myself to sit in an event for a week where you do meditation all day and all night. Okay, that's how I'm going to do it. So for I did it and it was freaking amazing. Whoa, I'm going again in June, by the way, because apparently I didn't oh, take, I'm kidding, oh but it's, I, I want to do the recharge again. And, but it's that, what are we so afraid? What am I, what are people like me who are so afraid of just that? Complete silence? Are, yes. It's not always there for me, but I've had that a lot. And it's what, why am I afraid to just sit still and I, what's show up? Yes. Yeah, so yes, I was picking up from basically that our brain is keep us always to try to keep us safe. So challenging our brain, mind is difficult, more difficult than to do the task that we are aware what we are avoiding. It's in the back of our subconscious, it's there. We know what we're doing. But one of the functions of the brain is keep us in, in, in a safe mode. So back now when we were talking about meditation that you mentioned it, that I found it very interesting for what the, the work that I'm doing with myself is the meditation is not to have a still mind, a mind that just that doesn't have thoughts. That's almost impossible. The, the moment is to accept those feelings and those, the, first the thoughts. You are trying to meditate and it's called the monkey mind. And everything happens at that moment. Even shit that you don't even remember, that moment is the moment. Meditation. And, or you're thinking, okay, I'm going to listen to this. And five minutes later, you go, what did this person just say? Because your mind just goes. Now, what I'm doing, what I'm realizing, what I'm working on now for many years is you need to let that happen, but you don't need to fight it. You need to let them hold the thoughts, even things that scares you a lot. Yeah, like I tell you, a confession. One of the things that scares me the most to think about it is death, an accident, Mm -hmm. something. Yeah. So suddenly I'm in the meditation and it's almost like purposely, boop, I, I think about something that will going to make me feel like, oh my God. And I already get into the, into this stage of, I think it's the amygdala that triggers all these chemicals and you get into this mode of preservation immediately. Like you need to put yourself into a safe mode and the safe mode is what you're used to do. That is basically embrace that thought. You go, no, some people touch wood. <laughs> other people start like oh my god that would never happen and you go through whatever defense mechanism that you have to deal with your thoughts immediately they trick you and goodbye meditation and then you think oh god i cannot meditate just an example so when i get into those triggers when i am trying to be quiet with me quiet means actually learn to listen to those thoughts that scares me so much and not have that reaction just let them pass not give them power you create that connection in your brain that every time you think about that, you react that way. Yeah. So is that is the quiet mind. It's not the fact that you are not thinking. It's the way that you are letting those, the thoughts pass by. And the other thing is where do you feel them in your body? Listen to your body is so important because it's all the connections. 
yeah, it's, it's brain and, and, and body and, and you have all your, your heart have an energetic uh, feel. Mm. Yeah, and you have their own nerve system, nerve system and, and your gut. And so it's a massive connection between all of these with all of these. So sometimes we have some memories that are attached to our feelings that are in our body. So when we feel threat by our thoughts, the first reaction, as I was saying earlier, the brain is to protect us. And in our old times, when we were in the, I don't know how you say this in, in English, but cavernas. Like right? the, okay. cave, the caveman days, yes. Cavernas. It was the survival uh, mode that our brain has us. And what happens when you feel that you, need, you are in, in a threat, you want to run, you want to fight, or you want to hide. But you cannot do either in this world. You cannot fight, does not, you cannot run every time you feel that, you know, it's not, it's feel safe. And it's running, fighting, or hiding, and you cannot hide. But we do in a way because we pick up the phone, we pick up the this, we pick up the that, we, and that's our way to to cope and to manage. Yeah, cope and manage. It's I think you're saying too. It's like the triggers we get when we get a trigger. If I'm understanding is that when something happens and we feel something in our body, to really pay attention to the signals our body gives us. If someone says something to me, or I walk by something, or I see something in my house that triggers a memory, I'll feel it in my body and I'll go, oh, usually it's in the pit of my stomach. Usually it's like right there, like solar plexus, a little bit lower. And I go, oh, and I'm like, okay. And all of a sudden my mood was happy. And all of a sudden I changed and I got some kind of just, dis, dis, we say dis-ease, some kind of like uneasiness about it. Yeah. And I go, oh. Okay. And then I'm, I love this because you've taught me a lot about this too, is, is I tap and I go, okay, just got the uneasy feeling. What just happened? And I pause and I become very alert and aware as being conscious of what's happening to us. And then it's like going, okay, that feeling I what did I just do? What just happened? What just, somebody just said something. I just looked at something. What was it? And I, oh, I see. Yeah. I've got all these silver dishes here from the party that need to be polished. I need to remember to yeah, I should have done that by now. I should have put those away or I need to. And so then I go, oh, that's something I have to do. And so I went, oh, and then I go, okay, that's nothing. All right, cool. Yeah. We can move on. Or I might look at something that reminds me of someone that I lost or someone that I'm not with anymore or a friendship mm -hmm. or maybe a business thing that I was doing and I didn't do anymore. And I, I came across something I went, oh, that was a failure. And then I, and then all of a sudden there's this wash of like a feeling of despair of failure, whatever it could be. And then if we don't take that moment to feel that body thought, and then to say, oh, what just triggered? What was that thought that I had? Look at the thought and go, okay, identify it. Look like I acknowledge, identify that thought. And instead of running, fighting or hiding is that is looking at going, okay, is this a real thing right now? It's no big deal. It's not there anymore. It's from the past. Oh, okay, sure. Got it. And it's that taking a deep breath, Bruce Lipton talks about it, or also actually Michael Singer in his book, Untethered Souls, leading back and going and just letting, don't stuff that feeling down, but just going, okay, just let it pass. I miss that person. Okay. And if we wait 15 seconds, it passes. But I think we get so busy in our lives. Me, anyway, I do that where it just stacks all day long. And then by the end of the day, I feel all these just like just anxiety of emotions. And I don't know where it came from because I didn't take the moment to just go, whoop, that was something. Okay. Move that on. Okay. Well oh, what was that? And so you're saying start with the body and you feel that trigger, trust your in intuition, trust that feeling, and then check it out and inquire, check, do a self check-in. Exactly. During the day or in that meditation moment, that is when your mind is start going a bit nuts uh, in thousand ways. It's just... Because the, 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 the sad thing is people stop meditating, yeah? Because they think they can't. And it's nothing more important that have that moment. It's mindfulness, I think is the name, right? Mindfulness, yeah. It's been there, it's been present. It's a form of meditation. I wash my dishes. I don't use the, can you call it dishwasher? Yeah, the you don't use the dishwasher, yeah. No. <laughs> I know everybody's what because I'm not saying every day obviously but I used to have this massive dinner parties with Jesus I know 100 people I so 200 glasses of wine etc cetera, etc cetera. 
we were very blessed that we have our helpers in the house and everything. But by the time my parties finished, that it was super late to anything, any help. So I remember I used to put the music on and and be so present. Not that I did it purposely, not that I thought, oh, I'm gonna meditate. And no, but the reason I don't use these watchers now is because I realized when I do that, I am super focused, even just washing the dishes. And that's a very form of disconnection of the outside and being present on, on that mm-hmm. moment. And it can happen with anything. And nothing needs to be for an hour or half an hour. If you manage one minute, one day, and then you can increase it every day for a little bit for whatever that makes you feel delicious with you and super connected, that's what it takes. The problem is to make everything so big. Again, the brain says to you, oh, no, too much. Safe mode. Don't do it. (laughs) Get back Mm -hmm. into your phone. And here's another one that, yes, and I love all that you said, because the dish, washing dishes, I think I have my best moments. It sounds weird in the shower. I can't do anything but like shower is not like there's no, I can't brought my phone into the shower before, but that's, but I'm listening to a podcast or something because I can't be alone with that. Yeah, my, my thoughts, but, but like being in the shower, driving, definitely laying in bed at night, getting, here's another one, getting a massage. When I get a massage, especially if I'm with somebody that doesn't talk the whole time, I can come up. I always wish I'd say, I wish I had my phone. I know it sounds weird, but I get so many great ideas and I've actually left it next to the table and I audio ideas as I'm getting, because I get inspirations, I get downloads in my massage. Because I'm like, oh my God, that's a brilliant idea. I should invite Leanna to Columbia. Yeah, a great idea. It's just like all these different things. I'm like, don't forget that. And I count them and go, okay, I had four ideas. Don't forget when you get off the table, record them on your way home. And I'm like, Cause it's like, you can't do anything else. So it's that form of what you're saying is find a way that it works for you to start and you build up to it. Don't just say every race is meditate for an hour. Every says take 30 minutes and you know, it has to be in the morning and Dr. Joe at 4.00 AM you're like, you lost me there. It's, but it's, I think there's a message and maybe it's just me, but what I do with things, they say how you do one thing in life is how you do everything in life. And so for me, it's, yeah, you're going to meditate today and say, yeah, today's the day I'm going to start my routine. I'm going to have my meditation in the morning. I'm going to do all this, blah, blah, blah. And I may do it for one day. And it's like, uh, my mind's going, yeah, you're not going to stick with us. You never do. And so we have that negative talk. There's that voice that some of us might have that says, yeah, but you're not going to really stick with us. You know that. So just why even bother? Cause you're just going to let yourself down again. And so I think I've gotten into the loop of not doing it because I know the pain of failing myself again is greater than the fact of just trying and doing it. Does that make sense? Again? Is that the pain of starting it because I know I'm not going to, I tell myself you're not going to stick with it because you never do. It's more painful to, it's easier to not start it at all than to say, I'm going to do it anyway. And because the, I know the pain of what, of me letting myself down is greater and so I don't even do it because you're going to feel more pain. But if you do it just once and then, you know, you're going to let yourself down and not do it. So don't do it at all because yeah. it's easier just to say it's so that's the, I, you would get, I got, I've gotten into this habit or routine of showing up that way. in a lot of things is that if I can't be consistent, don't bother starting sister, because you're not going to do it right. Whoa. Wow. Mm-hmm. So that's a really great reframe for me that I've been working on a lot lately is maybe it's not, maybe just your life is such that you have, I, I would tell my team, there's the Jill roller coaster, there's the up and the down. And I, when we meet, I go, okay, Jill's at the top of the roller coaster today. I'm great. I'm awesome. I'm solid. I'm ready to go. And then there's some days I'm like way down at the bottom and I'm like, okay, dig me off, dig me out of there. Cause I am, I got nothing. And then there's the mid range where I'm going up like a stock, the market's going up. It's bullish. I'm, I'm doing good. And there are days, whoa, I can see myself going down. And that's when I go, when I see it going down, it's who do I need to call? Who do I know? What can I tap into to get back to this upswing again? And it's, but I realized that's normal. I I had this thought that everyone's always most, everyone else at the top of the roller coaster all the time. And there's something wrong with me because I'm always this thing all the time. And then I accepted that I'm a roller coaster. Cool. That's cool. So find the times when I'm at the top and maximize and really punch those things out that I need to do and I want to do. And when I'm down, accept it and don't beat myself up that I'm down because I'll stay there a lot longer. So yeah, it, you just inspire me so much because I know you have your down moments, but 
you're just someone that is so consistent that I did not know about until we we had the weekend together in Cartagena, all your practices and all your wisdom and just your deep search for being in your highest self. It's just beautiful. No, oh, thank you, my Jill. And of course, I have to say, I have to say the same for you, seeing your journey. And I think I've been seeing your journey. I have, I, yeah. I have the privilege to say yes from super low down when you have your, you do your choices of things that for you at that moment were right and you need it and you went for it. Yeah. And I think <laughs> yeah. that's part of the healing, part of the process, part of everything to see <laughs> when you are now, because it's not that you change the way that the, the fact that you don't drink is not because you have a healthier life it's not because you are finding your purpose and it's more than that and all of that together with that more that i can go forever is how you start vibrating is your energy your this field that is around all of us that sometimes it gets very immaterial in our bodies it, it gets lost inside and others, when you start living in a different way, all that energy starts vibrates in the other way, connecting with the bigger energy that in this case for me is the, the universe uh, and the nature. So I think that vibration is what, what makes us vibrating in a, even if it's ups and downs, whatever, in that philosophy of life, let's call it like that, it makes us be able to have a type of conversations that you cannot have with another person that is vibrating differently. You already know, like you waste your time, try to explain to someone that if you kind of change this habit in this way, your life definitely is going to be better because for them, it doesn't make sense. You, you are in another planet and etc. So that's vibrations. And now we are going a big back because it's all, everything is a circle. So we're going, but a big back on that circle is friendships. And the people that we decide to surround ourselves with. And that anxiety that were, you were telling me when you are a, in a group of people that you go, I don't know, you start feeling this. Sometimes, definitely it could be all of us feeling that way. That is not our day. And other times it's because you elevate yourself, not as a, a human being in terms of being arrogant, but you elevate yourself in the way that you understand yourself so much more that actually are moments when you, you don't need to be there. And to recognize that also, that's very wise to say hello and also to know when, okay, I think I tried, I came, be very aware, no? Because that kind of became an excuse now to leave every time because you cannot, but yes, to be aware when definitely that, that vibration in that room with the people that you are, they are not in your field mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with them and it's nothing, nothing wrong with you. It's just the fact that you actually are more connected with you and you know what you're looking for a bit better. I love that. And, and I think that's something you, ref, you referred to earlier talking about as we get older and you and I both, it's like, there's a phrase, it's, it's English, it's older and a lot of younger people wouldn't know the word, but it's called a Rolodex. And it's a card. It's when we used to have business cards or we would write down, have cards or we'd keep all of our contacts before we had these things. And I had like double Rolodexes. Like I had two of the double ones that had two, two things, but I had two of those. And I had people that I knew like cards and business cards. And it was like, I knew so many people and I still do. And you do too. And, and we both had the same situation is how do, is that really just going in that closet? I love the analogies going in the closet and looking at it. It's, yeah, I can still have all these clothes and I can use the other closets now and putting clothes that I have in other places that I don't yeah. use a lot. I keep them for maybe off season or a different season in life. That's a good one. I like it is that we may bring this back in when it gets colder or when it gets warmer or we have different things that we wear. And then we have the, like the fancy clothes and then the sports clothes. And so they're used for, they're, they're, we wear them at different times. We need them at different times in our lives for different reasons. And so if there are things that are not really serving us anymore, it's in a beautiful way to almost release people. It doesn't, they don't have to know about it, but it's releasing them. So we have more space and our energy to be able to give to others. And I think the pandemic really showed a lot of us that me for sure is that we were, I remember before pre-pandemic when we were all hanging out together here and right after my husband died, everyone just said, just stay busy. And I'll tell you what, I had a calendar. I think I've told you, I've probably even shown that to you before. I don't have it like that now, but like this calendar, it'd be like, if I had an empty space between say 
it, it was Friday and I had a, I was done at four o'clock and I had nothing that night. And it was Thursday. I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do Friday? I got to find something to do. And it was this panic of you've got to fill the calendar. And so I grieved by staying busy and by going out and partying and socializing and just getting so lost in that experience that I didn't have to feel, I didn't have to think about it. And so that's the journey we were talking about earlier as I, me going, you've seen every side of me now and you see me married, you see me widowed, you see me being a single and living the life of a single here in Buenos Aires. <laughs> Let's just say it that, that way. Really and, uh, yeah. I've never done drugs in my life, I'm but I've had a party and I've smoked cigarettes and I have had a good time in the past. And I lived it, I, I played it hard. I worked it well. But then there was also that like fear of missing out. Like the, oh my God, Leanna's having a party at six or eight. Wait a minute. There's a thing at six. Maybe if we go to the thing at six, then we can leave early and we get to the thing at Leanna's by eight. But then there's this club that's not, it opens at one. So maybe we can hang out at Leanna's until one or maybe go have dinner at 11 and then we can get to the club by one. We were master orchestrators of our schedules. How do we fit everything and go to everything? And, and then the pandemic hit and it became more like we'd want to just, we'd hang out with anybody and everybody. It was just the people that we met. And then the pandemic hit and suddenly it was, we, we had a hard time juggling everyone. And then it was getting to be able to, when we had the pandemic, we connected with people that were important to us. And then coming back out of it, it was like, who resurfaced out of that? Who came back up out of that? And it was a lot less because we weren't going out and partying and keeping that kind of schedule anymore. And then it was like, it's like the people sifted out and then there were those that still stayed. And it was like, oh, okay, this is my core now. And now the core is way more important than just the, how many people can you connect with in one day or one week or a month? And it was a numbers game almost not intentionally, but just would seem that way. And mm-hmm. the other thing I just love is just how you were saying too, about being around people and having these experiences and just how we were, we just, we were, I always say the parties I've had in my house here, I'm in the kitchen now, and this little area has probably gotten more traction party wise than any other part of my house. But, but yeah, and there are video, we can't show videos, but there are things that have been here. We've had so much fun, but it was just, it became, we were like kids, like teenagers without adult supervision. We were just having a good time. And yet we realized that, I guess we just outgrew that a little bit, but Friends and the quality of friends became more important. And so it was less about how many people we connect with versus the ones that were really mattered and who were really important to us at the time. And I loved another thing you said, which is along those lines, is that some people will be in your lives for three years, for one year, for a lifetime, and it's okay. And that's the closet metaphor too. And then there was another thing about, you said about people with the expat community and just how, and I was just talking to someone here about this yesterday, about how would we be friends with the people that we're friends with as expats? This is a topic I want to get into for in a bit is this, how rich and beautiful it is to be an expat in another country. I've only had been an expat in this country. I know you're Colombian, your husband is from England. And so you're living in his home country now. And so you're an expat there as well. And you've lived in other countries too, as an expat. So do you find that same experience that where, where you connect with people that you normally wouldn't? It's like you have a common bond of being an expat and you just, it, it doesn't matter where they're from. I remember like having parties and going to like the, the Italian deli here and, and then hearing people speak English. And I'm like, oh, you speak English. Where are you from? And then you make friends because you hear them speaking English and you go, I'm having a party at my house tonight. Why don't you come? I know nothing about these people and I'm inviting them to my house. Would I do that in my home country? Heck no, because it's just, but there was some, there's something about that connection that's so special in expat communities that we, we just bond. You meet someone and you bring, and you're immediately in the fold. You'll find somebody who will connect you. Next thing you know, you're, there's this humongous group. What is unique about expats? And then I want to hear about what you're doing too with that in England, in Europe. Um, yes, it's a lot uh, to be unique uh, as an expat because it's a very small percentage in the world. I think it's like a one percentage of the people that get to live this life. So the definition of expat, expatriate, really is more like when, because when I used to have a, a TV show years, many years ago, before I started with the expat life name, I always found very curious living in Argentina when they asked me what you do and why you're here and which is this group of people. I was sitting on a table in a restaurant with 15, 20 nationalities. So finally, my God, who, what is this? And so I thought we are expats. Yeah, expatriates in Spanish would be patriots. Yeah. 
Ah. So they will look at us like expatriados, like expatriates, because for the world and for them and for the people that are don't know this world, this life, is basically that the expatriados, the expatriates, is the people that they throw them away from their country. They just expatriate them. Yeah. So I thought, okay, let's interview the people Patriot. in the street. Yeah, to see what, if they know. Walking in the street with a microphone, with a friend, I love this friend, Australian friend, Christine. Um, nobody knew what expatriate means, except for the fact that they look at you like, oh no, sorry, <laughs> they kick you out of your country. <laughs> so it's a very, you know, for us it's super normal, but I don't think it's a word that many people really is uh, aware of it. And expatriate means basically that a multinational, a company, or the diplomats organization take you away from your country and put you in another country. The beauty of the, they definitely expatriates you. They definitely take you away from where you come from to another country. Now, this comes with a lot of amazing benefits in terms of financial and they take care of you and you can save a lot of money and most of the things in this other country are paid. Yeah. That's the real expat. It's not a person that chooses by their own to go somewhere else because that you did it your own. It's the person that is being taken away from and put it somewhere else. Most of the ambassadors and people that works in the diplomat world and many CEOs, presidents, normally also is a, a person with a very high job. Yeah, these days a little bit less, but it used to be really the managers, the et cetera. And that was the group that we used to have in Buenos Aires, like the most fun, crazy people, but they were all pretty, living a pretty good life. And some people, they done seven, eight, nine different countries. So that's the expat and that's the expatriate. That's the real definition of an expat. I love um, that. I've never, I've never heard that before. And honestly, before I moved here, I didn't know what the word expat or expatriate meant. I honestly thought it was anyone who's living in a foreign country. That is brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to make sure we put that in the beginning too. That's good. Yeah, that's, yeah, and the only reason I know is because my program and I have to research and I have to, and then I go, okay, this is what it is. Because yeah, we talk like that and many people stay expat. What is expat? So that's it, expatriate, expatriado, expat. So actually, but now back into your question, when you have this type of life, as we know some uh, friends that we have in common, they've been already in seven countries. Normally the posting for an expat if it's an, a diplomat, lasts for three years, no longer than that. If they give you an extra year, it's incredible. And if you are from a multinational, yes, the same three to four years, but you can extend it depending on the job that you're doing in that country, in that specific country. Or normally these expats, they get to run more than one country, an entire a continent, like the LATAM. So anyhow, what happens when a company takes you? Normally these people are with families and could be a boy and a girl. Like I, I met a lot of diplomats that they were ladies, amazing girls. Majority definitely are boys. So they take you with your family, with your kids, and they you live for your life in, in the States or in Europe, and then they take you to Latin America, to South America, in this case, to Argentina. <laughs> when you don't have the language, when you don't understand what's going on, when it's culturally so different and challenging, and you don't know anyone. You really don't know anyone. So if you have kids, they all go normally to the same school as my, my girls went. And it's just living in a bubble, the expat bubble. And you start meeting the parents and going to every single party you get invited. Yes, any play dates if the kids are small. And you start creating that community, right? Because that's the only way you can survive and socialize. And I start asking people where you can, how do you say bread in Spanish? <laughs> where I can go, the simple things in life, they became the biggest challenge ever. Something that no one ever even thought about it because they never left their own country. Yeah. It became the biggest challenge ever. So with that, that minus example to everything else, what life brings you every day, your personal challenge, your family challenge as a parent, as a husband, as a wife working, but then you have to deal with a whole culture shock 
and that's your life for three, four years and it's nothing you can do about it. So then comes mentality. Some people are more built for that and they embrace it almost immediately and others, they really struggle and that's very sad to watch. But for the ones that we embrace it very quickly <laughs> and we go for the positive of the place have to give us as we did, we love it. And we start all getting together and, and, and having a, a great time. But the mind of an expert is have to be incredibly strong because as fun as you have and in the world position that you land in a country, that other contrast that I'm telling you about to deal with that life that, and the, the fact that you, you met friends and you're going to say goodbye to them in three years. Fact. In three years, you're changing house. In three years, and normally you don't know where you're going after six months before or three months before because sometimes I keep it quiet. So it is incredibly challenging, the life of an expat, and equally comes with friendships and equally comes with everything that goes in life. But also you met the, more strong, the strongest people with the open-minded and accepted acceptance to culture and the world. And the kids that grow up that way, you realize their mindset is they call it citizen, uh, citizens of the world, these kids are. Mm. Because they really don't care where they're going to live. They embrace any culture, any color, any religion. And it's just, it's life. It's the world. It's not like uh, the frontier. It's all. And that's wonderful. And that's a bless. And that's the best thing, what I gain for the expat life that we have. I don't feel myself anymore as an expat here. Back now into your point. Because we choose to come here and to have a, a change of, 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 of life and because we have to for different reasons and because uh, our oldest daughter was now coming to Europe to, to study, to university and etc. So I embrace it England, London in the way that I know that is basically open-minded, smiling to everything that goes on and also getting angry and fighting and going also like F England, why this, why that? Of course it happens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Obviously. <laughs> but the truth is, even like everybody goes, oh my God, the weather. I don't have a problem with the weather because I only see what I wanted to see. And it sounds like, of course it bothers me if it rains all the time and I need to, it's the normal, but it's not, my focus is not in the weather. My focus is not there. Yeah. And it's really, I cannot change that. It's, it's impossible. So I embrace in this place as, as much as I can. And I feel that because that attitude opens doors immediately. Yeah. And what is different is a challenge. And I'm welcome for that. I'm like, bring the challenge. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's super doable. Mm. And in this case, when with no support of, in this case, a support of a company or anything behind you, is like we are here and we need to move in the way that that the way the way that we, we, we know. So basically I, I start searching for my expats friends that we always keep connected. And as I say, some of them are incredibly good friends as we, we were talking about you and I for so many years. And it's not like we are in constant nya, 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 because this is friendship is that you don't need to be all the time in each other's pocket to know that you have each other. Yeah, that's true. hundred percent. So all those people I, I found, as I say to you, superpowers, family and friends. When I look around, I'm thinking, oh my God, I have these amazing people that I can call friends in so many countries. And then also I know amazing people that I know that are not my best friends or my super friends or my friends that are people that I know enough because we live such a bubble life for three years together. Yeah, it's like going to mm -hmm. a boarding school or something like that. Did you know that people are better than you will know anyone in three years in another circumstances? Right? Yeah, so, we, sure. so we still have a connection, even if these people are not your good friends. So I utilize that in the best of the ways to, to try to still bring people together from different countries. And I did this beautiful event in last September in a gorgeous castle in, in Scotland, Turing Castle, where I brought, you know, 20 people together from different countries to spend a weekend, 
to catch up and to revive all those old times that we all live when we were living in Argentina. And that's something magical. So the expat life, the magical of expat life is yes, your mind is open, your brain rewires different, you challenge yourself, you are out of the comfortable zone. All the things that we've been talking about, being expat put you out there immediately. You have no option. Yeah, you rewire yeah. differently. You see the world differently. And then when you find these people, yes, we became more selected now that we get older, but if I would carry on living as an expat, I'm still, I'm no expat, but I'm still, this is not my country. And I found myself way more selected because I have such a strong core in all around. I don't know anyone in, in my neighborhood here, no one. And I love it because I need this space for me. <laughs> I want to go out, I say hello, but that's it. And I create my world in London with, I have some great friends, a lot of people that I know, connections, uh, but I know that around the world, I have all these amazing human beings that I can call friends for real. Yeah. I, I have the same. I totally agree. It's amazing how it opens a world of, of just being, I love what you said is students, is it students of the world or? Citizens of the world. Yeah, it's, it's so true because we've met so many different people. And even when they move, we still stay in touch with them and you still have a friend wherever they go. And I think that's so awesome. It's I think a that's special so awesome. connection. So I don't know if I answered your question about the expat life, and but I think- yeah. So yeah, because I want to know what you're doing today too. And like, how are you working with things you're doing today in, in the special projects? Because I know you're launching some new things and you're always up to something. And I think it's, people just need to follow you. Your Instagram and- You've taught me one of the things we we worked on in Colombia is you were really helping me get my social media game on and improve <laughs> and to just share more of my life because you're really an open book and it's you don't worry about what people think about you in a way that it's not a it's not like a like an f you I don't care what you think about me it's more like I just have to for me I have to express myself the way that I express myself and I'm not going to hold back based on what I think people are going to want to see or not see. And your Instagram is always so amazing. And so I'll put it in the, in the description too. And so everyone can follow you and check you out because you're so fun and you have so many things you're always up to. And so anyway, tell us what you're doing now. Thank you, my dear. I'm going to try to keep it shorter because one of the things that I like to do is talk. You can always no, witness. perfect. Ever. So by those magical things in life, I got connected uh, to this uh, sculpture. A sculpture? A sculptor, like a person, a sculptor? Yes. So an mm -hmm. artist that is in a sculpture, yeah. Cool. And it happens to be that he is the artist that is going to finish a legacy from Michelangelo. Wow. Talking about Michelangelo, uh, that he started 500 years ago. So this project that I got involved two months ago, this project has been going for four years, but until I got involved, we decided to do some changes to bring this now out of out into the world so hopefully everybody's going to hear about it i am very passionate about this because this is everything that i like condensing in in one piece and is culture cultural is art involves humanity involves a uni united of generations we're talking about an artist michelangelo he did this two cristos porta croce it calls the christ carrying the cross Porta Croce, as the saying in, in, in Italy, Italian. And, and Michelangelo did two of these sculptures, very famous. And he wanted to do a third one, but he could not carry on. And now the same family that owns the, they call it also the Justiniani Christ, this same family, uh, the Justiniani family have commissioned this uh, sculpture to create the third Christ carrying the cross. Okay. So it's a very big subject. I'm big. I can go through so many details because it's so intense what this is gonna, what is happening, what is going to be, and what is gonna mean in the world of art, without a doubt. Um, so I as I just super blessed that I met this person, we connect, I saw a lot of things that this project can have. And again, with this amount of connections around the world, I saw the way that we can make this bigger or help it to make it bigger. 
And that's what I'm doing now. Basically, I am the project manager of, of uh, globally of this unique project uh, that now we've been supported by UNESCO and uh, Carrara UNESCO and many other massive organizations. So it's going to be just about of, of time for you to see. I think this is going to be all over in every single media, in every single paper when we come alive, uh, because it's, it's pretty unique. Yes, I, I, I can no extend it longer. I hope I've been clear enough because it's difficult to, to yeah, play no. in, right. in the right uh, direction. But this uh, sculpture that is being born right now, in, it came from Carrara, and now it's going to travel the world in the make, in the make. So and this artist I? is going to expose as something that the, the biggest artist in the world and the time that with art was a bit different what, what, what we consume now, he's going to expose that work when you work with hands and when your back hurt and when you have to take something like marble and, and make something that I don't understand how they make this. It looks like it's plastiline how they work this. So it's insane. And it's, it is a Christ, but it's not going to mean that it's going to be focused on religious because this is a Christ that needs to unite um, the world in many forms and many, many ways. So we're working with very amazing people to create the Trinity uh, of the two Michelangelos, the two Christes carrying the cross that they are in specific places in Italy that everybody, when you go to Rome, you can see you one see of them. them in one of the most famous places. And so they, one of them is going to represent the father, the other one represents the son, and the one that my sculpture <laughs> is doing, it represents the Holy Spirit. But all is going to be out there in a very special way. Therefore, everybody feels identified with. And this involves a bit of our conversation because the, the Holy Spirit, what is that in a trinity? So it's an, 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 an tangible, an, an touchable. I don't know how you, how you say that. There's something that the Holy Spirit is. A, so the way that this is, needs to be represented is, 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 is in a very specific way, a special way. And it represents the unit of what we are as a humans. We are the three of these things. What they all represent is what we are. So this Christ that is going to go around the world, it will represent humanity in that way. So hopefully everybody can relate. And the way that we are telling the story and the way that is, this has been happening for four years. I only got involved two months ago, but this has been very kept very quietly happening. Uh, is going to be, I think, it's going to be like a renacimiento of this century with a contemporaneous artist uh, and his vision, but working in the same way that these guys used to work 500 years ago. And that's uh, incredibly special, incredibly mm. special. So that's the project. I think that is so cool. And, and I everyone can get information for sure on your social media on Instagram. And I'm, again, I'll post all the links because you're always up to something amazing. And no matter where you are in the world, there's people are just drawn to you. And so I consider it a real privilege and honor and pleasure to call you my friend. Oh, absolutely. Same here, my Jilly. I feel super honored to be sitting here with you talking about everything because the truth is we have nothing planned can i tell that when you asked me for the interview i received these emails where i have these questions of like do you want to talk about something like that? and my answer to you was me well enough <laughs> which is let's go and do it and, and be spontaneous and see what comes from this conversation because i think as we pointed out earlier um we have this type of conversations with a uh, camera on and off Yes. Regardless. This is us. Yes. And I think we talked about that in Cartagena. We're like, we should do a podcast. We should do an interview. And yeah, it was because it was, we were just both for hours just talking and we were so fascinated and learning so much from each other. And so it's, that, that's my goal. My purpose is always to share information with people, resources, experiences, places and and people and this is me sharing with my viewers and subscribers friends is I'm sharing my friends with you today I say I, I'm sharing friends and family and other professions all these different people that are going to be in, on my channel and today you're meeting one of my friends that I am so happy to introduce you all to so thank you Liana for your time and I look forward to seeing you you're definitely going to 
have to come back here. We have to find a way either I get to London or we're going to have to rendezvous here again. I know you were just here right before I got here. And so it's just, you're always in my heart. So thank you for being oh, so cool. Thank you. So no, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you're doing an amazing job. Keep going because you. you know, the world needs people like you and uh, for real. Likewise. So, and, and see you here in London. You have to you go bet. to Europe now. I, I know it's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn to head that way. Thank yeah. you again. And yeah, thank yeah. you everyone for watching. Yes, uh, it was a pleasure to be here, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>